Hi, everybody. Um, there are a few questions from Jen Butler and, and a few questions uh, regarding meditation. And surprisingly, uh, not that many questions. So I wish you all well, but send more questions. Um, Jen says, I'm really looking forward to the webcast tonight. And so am I, Jen. I have several questions, uh, whatever, which one makes sense. She says, is there a centripetal force uh, circling above the crown center? If so, what is its significance? Well, I'd, I'd like to say something about the naming of that force. Um, it can, it can come straight down, it can come up from below, it can come from the sides, it can come from behind, from the front, whatever, which way it chooses to be. Can there be a circular motion above the head? Yes, there can. Uh, I would please um, ask you to be a little careful about naming it, uh, because really our knowledge about these things I know our pseudo-knowledge is great, but our real knowledge about these things is fairly low. So if we start mm, designating certain kinds of things that we want to define, it really is basically based on interpretation. And we have a great mm, willingness to interpret just about everything. Yeah, I know. It makes you feel as if you actually know something. That is important for our personalities. And remember, our personalities are a rendering of mm, energy for the purpose of engaging with others and survival during our past right up to now, like age zero right up to now, plus, of course, old lifetimes, all the rest of it. And we will tend to, strikingly, unusually uh, strange, you might think, uh, attempt to utilize, and we're going into a space of time where people can use these energies purposefully because you can learn how to use them. But it's an extension of the personality. Uh, you want to get as much juice as you possibly possibly can uh, out there based on what you want, what you don't want, how important you think you are, how, how you aren't, uh, depending on your take in, in your personality life and how it's been constructed, and how you protect your past based on all of the structural forms and systems that you've been involved with so that you can actually survive from your perspective. Uh, these images are shockingly blatant and totally, most often, unconscious with respect to our own understanding of them. Uh, but nonetheless, we're trying to, we will try to make them conscious. It's part of the thing we do. Um, there's a measure that is in the world of our persona or our personalities. If you can perceive something different than somebody else, you're extra special. That's kind of semi-surface. And I know I've talked about this before, and I understand that. But I think there isn't a limit to the amount of times that it needs to be spoken about so that we can understand from our personal perspective that we are doing these things. And that is really based on intense will, intense purpose uh, on the things, uh, or focus on the things that we believe we need to focus on for our own benefit. Uh, I happen to not call this negative, but I do call it personality-induced. The inducement comes from what we believe, we think, 
has to occur for us to feel comfortable. And the flow of energy that is internally engaging with us, or some might say a higher self or soul, the soul mechanism itself through the chakras or Zephyroth or anything else you want to call them, um, these are nothing but valves. And you engage with your relationship with an ever-expanding amount of movement through these valves for the benefit of higher state moving through the valves that are that have let's say the energy has created the personality so it moves through the personality that is created by you and you have used that flow and there is an inducement there uh, within that structure to help you to survive it's really survivally or focused on survival primarily this is very difficult to talk about because there's a screeching yelling that goes on about no 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 we have to uh, realize that we have no real personality oh, i would agree with that no real personality but the personality that we've created and there is a tremendous ultimate inducement to let go of things that are created by us so that we can literally as a being of consciousness watch the personality but also watch the energy moving through it f through the soul into and through the personality itself maybe some of these questions will talk about that uh, what is the signif significance uh, uh, Jan says uh, of the hands and feet coming on at the same time how do feet help in moving the energy? You know, it's an interesting thing. If you notice this, you walk on feet all the time. Sounds a little weird. You use your hands all the time. These four centers are the easiest ones to turn on. If you can also understand, uh, moving to the first question, that the crown center is linked up with the root center even at its lowest ebb and many people these days are connected at least fragmentarily to the crown center from the root center which includes the gonad center which operates through the emotional centers into the heart the throat the brow the crown in the old traditions a lot of focus was put on trying to engage these centers in a very subtle way so that higher states could operate through literally through all of the centers that are was that really was in the etheric body but the emotional body as well the mental structure as well that pretty well coordinated and when it core, they, all these uh, three levels of engagement, physical, emotional, and mental, coordinate, we call that the personality. It's not the only effect that relates to the personality because previous lifetimes also affect the personality. And there's a, a very interesting thing that occurs here. If you follow that through, follow it through to the idea that you're relating to the personality as a larger whole, then you can slowly begin to realize, certainly at the etheric, emotional, mental level, and physical level, the body itself is also just nothing but particles, as physics tells us. And our engagement with these particles is very similar to an engagement with particles we can't see. Energy flows into those states or levels and also at the same time energy flows through them and because we are within that whole 
we can watch that occur. It takes a little practice, but not much. All we have to do is be okay with watching what we do. And then begin to allow ourselves to focus off the body around us as if we're watching the body. And then you'll notice that we're also watching around the body. One could say that this is a kind of clairsentience, a clairvoyance, even a, an interaction with higher states related to clairaudience as well. But, you know, in the long run, you're trying to slow down the personality states so you can see beyond and through them. Not magically noticing anything, just actually noticing something legitimately there. And we use it for our own purpose. And we divine what purpose that should be almost reflexively because it's all focused on the same thing. Our protective and private way of engaging with our personality's survival the way we think it should be and the way we assess the world and how it, that should be. Very interesting thing if you're looking at the whole then you look at the feet and the hands and the top of the head and the root center as part of the linking of the whole. Now, it would be different if all of these happened actually separately. And they don't. They happen to broaden out an aspect within us that is not quite broad enough to handle more energy or more flow from another state. It's continually being affected and effectively being engaged with an editing or a pressing forward of a flow of energy so that we can begin to understand that what we're perceiving, not seeing, but perceiving, because it acts out in uh, sometimes visual ways, sometimes sensory ways. The sensory way is the oldest one we have because it starts in the womb, so very easy one to engage with. But in this sensitization of the form through which you engage in life, is this form is vital to us, but at the same time, it can be used as an eye. This whole system is an eye from bottom to the top. If your feet are on really strongly, if your hands are on very strongly, wherever they're on will reflect what's on in the system that we are not quite able to perceive which is often called emotional off the body, etheric off the body, mental off the body, because you can perceive mental in the body, theoretically, emotion in the body, and a kind of a magnetic engagement with others because you want them to like you or be around you, as long as you don't push them away, then you, what you're really basically doing there is you're recognizing that you're using energy purposefully for your own particular purposes and you can learn to watch that and you can learn from it because everybody is doing exactly the same thing. I find that very fascinating because if they are, then why are you judging other people and what they're doing? You could be actually noticing that they can only do it the way they're doing it. And tomorrow they may be able to do something slightly different. But today, in this second, in this moment, this is what they are doing. And they tend to protect what they have been doing, the same as we protect ideas in terms of what we believe or might believe or think we need to believe to be part of... Hmm, 
uh, the way we like to think we think. Those things are not negative. They're precursors to ideas that may be different tomorrow if we can allow them to be noted by us. This, of course, can happen on a higher emotional level or literally on a physical level or li literally a higher mental level. If the mental protection can be softened, ideas can break through that pressure that we put on ourselves to remain the same because we're open to it. It's like op being open to a truth that we held so high that we protected it and suddenly be okay with respect to opening to a broader truth. Even though in the moment we think it can't be true because it doesn't relate to what we're protecting. These things are normal in us as human beings. They are not negative at all. But think, if the whole system is involved with the very big mystery, the very, um, you could say, occult, you could say, mystical mystery of the seven, then the three, then the one that was talked about and tried to be interpreted for years, then you have seven chakras. This, we all know what that seven is, no doubt. Then we have the three. The three levels of combining, excuse me, <clears throat> combinations of energy that come together. The root cone of the solar plexus lights up the heart, the throat, the brow, and the crown to a point where the throat, the brow, and the crown can be broadened beyond what lights them up. Think about that for a second. <coughs> Well, I have more water. <laughs> so then you have the throat, the brow, and the crown being lit up more, and they begin to light up and send energy down to the root, the gonad, and the solar plexus, where the originating energy comes from to enable them to be open initially. This really sounds very reminiscent of us trying to figure out our relationship with higher states. Then, what happens after the increased energy that occurs beyond the lighting up that originally came from root gonad, gonad and solar plexus, what happens then to it if energy comes down from a different level in those three pivotal clusters of the brow, the throat, and the crown center? <coughs> it expands the root gonad and solar plexus, prepares them to handle more energy. So that energies related to the heart, related to the throat, brow, and crown, can be opened even more. And you get the sense that all of these centers are working together. Because they are. Towards an ultimate purpose. So you had the first three clusters, we're going at solar plexus, then you get the second three clusters, brow, crown, throat, and all of the centers behind the neck, of course, related to the throat. Or you could say ultimajor, as some have said, or the centers that are related to the seven sisters, if you will, and others have said. 
<coughs> and they're expanding. And as the throat center expands, it sends energy to the upper part of the heart center. It turns it on. It fuses with the lower aspect of the heart center, stimuli stimulated by the root gonad and solar plexus, originally, which turned on the heart center to some degree. Now, as that crown center begins to open even more, and there is a link up across it from the front, that center right in the middle that links to the sides over here, then suddenly what you get is a link up with the heart and the crown, which is tremendously powerful. And the third cluster, which lies in the heart center, begins to open up above it and below it even more, spreads that flow broader and links up into a kind of oneness, thus the mystery of the one. Now the purpose, what happens then, I should say, with the personality in the meantime? Well, it's constantly trying to reassert its past engagement with self-protection. It's constantly trying to engage beyond where it was. The individual that calls himself uh, Jane, Jack, uh, Lucy, I don't care who, is constantly recognizing things not only in themselves but in others. And they need to have a lens in there that allows them not to assess and judge the way we've been trained to do, but to recognize and perceive the relationship that others have within the construct of the soul level is where are they handling that tremendous level of shift and change and refocus, reconsideration that's going on almost daily. Now Paul, I know, said, I die daily. But the issue there is he changes all the time and some things he didn't change that well. But it's not Paul's fault. He was trained that way. Our training we have lots of training. Some of the stuff we protect is really related to the great fear we have of being observed by other people in a totally different way than we want them to observe us. It's always the same for us. And by the way, that's consistent. Every person, whether they acknowledge or don't acknowledge that particular vulnerability, suffers through that vulnerability. None of us are perfect. That's how it is. We're still in a process of learning. The dilemma of learning <clears throat> and keeping face, saving face, because anyone watching whatever learning that we go through always assesses that learning based on them. Quick to judge not very quick to understand. Understand that. Know it in you. Back away. Try to understand how it is you'll get through the next moments when you're involved with that particular person. If they're going through some trials and tribulations of their own self-interest. Everybody does. Now, I'm not sure how that fits totally, but her next question why does an increase in energy often cause us to feel fatigued, spaced out, and scattered? Can you understand that better now, Jen? More energy coming in affects the solar plexus, root, and gonad center. The key implements of a personality's engagement with life. Yes, I know. The brow center is affected too. The throat, the heart center. I know this. Crown center. But literally, the relationship that you have with these is still the use of energy to protect your relationship with how you've been before. 
if you can look at that as if it's not negative, but partly involved with the natural nature of survival, then you will feel a little bit more comfortable, but still feel awkward each time you are engaged with a, a kind of a little bit more energy coming through from other states or different frequencies. <clears throat> the most wonderful thing about that is that indicates and designates change at the same time that enables us to realize that our relationship literally is involved with continual growth. Very important from uh, my perspective uh, because we all are growing, that's for sure. Um, I'm just looking to see if I have left anything out. I'm trying to write this stuff down because I for sure want to make sure that whatever ideas that seem to be reasonable get talked about. Uh, in, way, in what way does it help when people who are practicing energetically uh, get together and practice and meditate together? Well, if you sort of understood what I was trying to talk about before, then think of this in a very interesting way. Let's say two people get together, or three people get together, and they are engaging energetically with each other. You understand the dialogue is that no matter who you have around, they are transmitting to you, and you are transmitting to them. The trick in this is to be willing to allow yourself to attempt to perceive <clears throat> where that transmission is coming from. Now, in the, some of the old traditions, they say, well, if you have energy coming from a root gonad solar plexus level, that's a low level. It, we have to revise some of this. These are some of the truths that kind of make sense because <laughs> as we stand up, our feet are the lowest, the hair on our head, if we have any, is the highest. So when you're looking at it from a very, very weakly logical method, if you look at it as if you were a fused being, then every center that opens differently than yours is effectively, effectively helping you to broaden out your relationship with the center that's open in you. That means you will have stimulation in places that you're not used to. Once you stimulate a place in you that's not you're not used to, it will stretch a bit that center. If it stretches a center and energy is normally used to coming through the way it was before, it will open and stretch other centers as energy moves from the bottom to the top. That will affect the centers above the diaphragm as well as below. Can you see how that might be important if you're trying to broaden out the lens that you're using, the form that you're involved with, beyond what it was before, so you might perceive differently how another is functioning. functioning. First, no, no doubt, you will perceive it the way you think you need to perceive it. Second of all, you may perceive just a little bit differently than you could before, adding another ingredient, which doesn't necessarily mean an ingredient that judges, but an ingredient that you perceive that is broader in a certain way than yours. Perhaps you can allow yourself to learn from that 
<coughs> there is no sequel to learning except learning. Learning is very valuable. Perceiving differently than what you already believe you have to protect is valuable to a degree, but not necessarily helpful. If you can inundate this little sliver of willingness to go beyond what you believe has to be true, you will have to use that as time goes on, as your moments continue, because you are training to be able to note your relationship with that flow from the soul and beyond that operates through those sh chakras or zephyra that are literally an aspect of the soul structure. And as they are able to broaden out and you're able to handle that broadening, then you become more perceptive from a different perspective. That means the thing you call you sees differently, understands differently, is willing and perhaps curious about understanding more because you've just learned something, whether you wanted to or not, or protected yourself from learning something that didn't comply with the rules and regulations of age zero to whatever age you are now. Sobering. Great respect to everybody. Very difficult to do often, but worth interpersonally to be willing to consider. Working with two or three people in the old traditions, the old the old traditions always said similar things. There was always a big mystery about why that should be. Wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there I will be also. What? What? Your sincerity and willingness to learn beyond what you need to protect is vital in an, in an engagement that relates to levels beyond where you can reach currently. The sincerity is really valuable. The willingness not to protect as much is part of the sincerity and also part of the honesty that you attempt to have with yourself You can honestly say, well, I'm not open in this particular area. Why should I be? It's been good to me for the last 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. And why should I bother? You'd be absolutely right. Uh, normally, people only live to about 100 to 120. The last one person lived quite long that I met and knew. Uh, I don't want to live that long. I think he said that, at least the radio report was, he died at 146. I find that hard to believe. I even found it hard to believe when I saw him. He looked about 130. <laughs> but he was remaking his face. And then his neck and brain and his hope, hopefully getting to his lungs, which were really basically quite old at the time. What do you mean he was remaking his face? Uh, his face looked like a baby's butt. Smooth, no wrinkles. Ding, 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 ding. And none of those things. And he was in Philadelphia. And, you know, what is it? The city of brotherly love? Whatever. <laughs> But the issue there was that he was in constant prayer all the time, from his perspective, engaged with the higher state, 
and there were many people around at the time, and they were literally um, quite uh, willing to consider that he was, I think at the time, about 130-some-odd. I saw him about 10 years before he died, uh, and he was on oxygen in a hospital bed, but he was still functional mm, from a hospital bed. Interesting, because why I said that was, if you maintain exactly how you are right now until then believing exactly the way you believe only because you think that that's the only way the truth can focus, well, I hope the truth that you have today is a stepping board to truth that you experience in a deeper level tomorrow. I couldn't ask that any better for you or for me, no matter what it would be. It doesn't matter. Anyway, that is part of the answer to that question. Your relationship with others stretches you. I had one question at one point where someone said, well, didn't the sages go off into uh, a cave and uh, all alone? And, well, let me tell you that, in other words, got away from people real fast. Yeah, that's true. But there's a favorite story that the Hindus uh, speak about. I'm not sure if the, the Buddhists do the same thing about this one, where a gentleman was told to go into a cave for 10 years, and he did faithfully. And he had to deal with another person. Guess who that person was? Himself. Try being with you in silence for 10 years and see what happens. Well, all right. Let's not only focus on that. Let's come out of the cave. He came out of the cave, and there happened to be a village not too far off. A couple of people had dropped off milk and uh, some rice, uh, boiled rice, like a cereal, uh, porridge. And he ate, and he meditated all the time for a 10-year period. So he went to visit the village, and he went to a well to get something to drink. And there was a person there. And the impact of the energy from that person was strong. What level of engagement would one think? This lady turned to him when he asked if she would get him some water. And the blast of energy on those first three levels was strong, and he wasn't used to dealing with this within himself because he was focused on being spiritual inside the cave because that was his focus. He had forgotten in 10 years the relationship that he had with those three centers, forgotten the relationship over a period of time in 10 years. Not annihilated the three lower centers. Doesn't work that way. Some people believe it does, but it doesn't. They had been stretched, related to higher levels of those first three levels, and energy was moving back and forth, but the focus was more on the higher levels. When he comes into the proximity of another person who is dealing with survival, he looks at her and he finds her exceptionally beautiful, magnetically engaging, profoundly strong, and he falls in love and gets married. For 10 years, the story goes. Then his previous guru comes to get him and says, you have spent 10 years in a high state and 10 years 
in this state. Neither are wrong nor right. They are as they are. It is time for you to leave. Are you ready to leave? And he had a couple of kids, three kids, I guess, as the story goes. So he tells his, his wife, which she knew his story, because they knew about the, the sage up in the hills in a cave, and tells his wife that it's time for him to leave. And she said, I expected this. Pretty impressive. And he leaves. And now he has to learn the relationship between high states and the current state that he has. Because the high states have not gone away. And the low states have not gone away. It's a really interesting story, filled with depth of knowledge. These two must come together. And we think often, once you attain some sort of high state, you will never be involved with the low levels again. Not so. The infusion of both levels to a point enables the broader engagement literally to be one so that you can watch and perceive the engagement of the levels that others are in and how difficult it is not to be in those levels. <coughs> this is a concept that relates to, in Buddhism, compassion. It's a concept of loving others who cannot deal with the difficulties that they have, as well as those who can. We know about that one. Who would you choose to be on your team if you were choosing a team? A person who is really successful in life? Or one that sometimes is successful, sometimes is a failure? Or one who always fails all the time? It's not even 30 seconds yet, and I, <laughs> I would imagine you already know what the answer to that question might be. Maybe. Now, in the meantime, now, since I said that, you're reasserting your uh, uh, understanding of what might be there, perhaps, and you're saying, well, not necessarily. I might pick the middle one. Yeah, 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 you might. But if you wanted the best team in a certain area, you would pick the best team in that area? Perhaps. If you wanted people to think you were really spiritual, you might pick any of them. <laughs> but secretly, if you're in competition with other teams, you would like to pick the best team, the one that would win. It's not a bad thing. It's how we're trained. It's the normal thing. It's part of the reason why every time we turn around and we have an idea that we think is extra special and very, very good, then we're really putting down other people's ideas. It's okay. It's not necessarily real, although it could be. Absolutely. Depending on the subject. If you broaden your relationship out with engaging with others, you have an effect on yourself. If you actually listen to other people, you will definitely affect your relationship with you. If you can actually understand the great depth of engagement and complexity that others have within themselves, just engaging with life, you will recognize the complexity and capacity that you have yourself. If you understand the great inability that others have within themselves, perhaps if they're trying to integrate levels in this lifetime that they could literally not be able to integrate based on their past engagement with levels of 
flow, for example, from higher estates, then you will understand how difficult it is for them to handle a relationship with completely different energies than what was there before in other lifetimes. Higher states don't judge like this. We do. And when we're assessing higher states, we always think they're judging. I wonder why. We do see through us. Is there an implication that we may judge other people just a wee little bitty? Absolutely possible. It depends, we would say. I find it humorous to laugh at, at ourselves. Oh, excuse me, when we can. Real hard when we can't. Nothing negative about that. But it is important if you're meditating with others. I find it very interesting that energy softens down and others can flow in. I find that fascinating. It's temporal. Just for a short period of time. As soon as you're not meditating. Or if you're not really focused on the greatness that you are for meditating well. If you allow the letting go of you and what you think other people might be seeing if they look at you, then there is a depth of movement internally, which is tremendously helpful within us. <coughs> no disrespect to anybody who can't do that, because all of us have moments when we can't. Recognizing it is an aspect of becoming awake. If you talk about realization, it's an amazing place to be in a moment where you can see yourself doing you for the purpose of engaging with you, the you that you've constructed in a manner that is absolutely just right for you in that moment. And if you can notice when you're not happy about how you function, that is a serious moment. Be okay with it. And just try to do something different the best you can. You'll find that's not that easy. Whatever you do, you will be affecting energy coming in in that second. It will continue on in an elongated second and help you if you can get yourself to back away from addressing a wondrous moment of being right or wrong for that matter and let it be there. Quiet down and know that that flow is there. You will know it consciously because it's trying to help you to perceive that it is you. And you are it. There are, uh, I think I said this before, but uh, no two people have the same frequencies passing through them exactly in the same way. It amounts, it amounts in mixture of how they function. This is important to understand. We normally simplify. Akim's a razor, people say, well, the simplest thing has to be true. The simplest thing is not always true. Different pers personal ways of using the frequencies for one's own purposes are developed individually for survival. There's nothing negative. A different in the different intensities at various times are used differently. And different mixtures and frequencies and dominances engage at different times as well. Um, if you keep in mind that 
each person's energy can broaden or change another's in their proximity. In other words, if you have three people together or four people together and you're meditating in small groups, you could all four of you engage with a higher state. If one person engages sincerely, it will help you broaden a bit and open more to the perception of that state which is beyond what you're normally used to perceiving. And I know there are signs, and I, I mean, those states are, I'm talking about uh, a, an interaction with deeper levels um, that operate through those chakras or, or Zephyroth uh, from higher states. Uh, we're trying to link those states together when we're meditating and trying to engage with these states that we live in and link into in our conscious modes plus an engagement with acknowledging and perceiving states that interact with when we quiet down those beta lower alpha levels uh, higher alpha levels in other words uh, levels where you can be mm, a little bit mm, calm, gentle, but still perceiving wide awake. Um, I'm just checking uh, because we're looking at meditation. So, uh, if if you understand, uh, years ago there was something that was I found kind of interesting. Um, I used to draw one uh, container, like a beaker, for example. Um, and as that beaker filled with, with energy or water to the top, it would flow over. And it would automatically broaden out the personality form, one could say, I know there's a lot to talk about in terms of form, into a bigger beaker, higher, broader, diameter, bigger. And it would feel as if you've taken a step back. I don't have this anymore. I don't have that anymore. I've said that before, too. So. Uh, what's going on here? And slowly the, the flow increases. Perception is different than it was before not the same and you grow a bit until the beaker flows and then all of a sudden it's flowing over it's all you can handle and then there's a stretching going on to build a bigger now it's a pale bigger beaker so to speak and it starts the the previous beaker only fills the bottom and it feels as if Oh, I'm not as good at meditating. I'm not as good at perceiving, whatever that would be. And you can't throw away what you perceived before. It's a pathway, remember? A stone, you stepped on it. Okay, now another stone is occurring. And it starts to flow. And this continues on, on and on and on. But in the meantime, you are the being that's noticing these things ever so slowly, more consciously, almost like you're looking through a lens at your own being. And you realize the added engagement or flow is part of your own being as well. But it's not personalized, not named like we've named, like mine, Ron, or you, this or that. No, it's named container for the help of others in a manner that relates to the relationship with higher levels as opposed to what has to be done at the lower level. Because we've already identified so many times what should be, what is, what can't be, what, you know, so many things. The more you read, the less you truly understand what's true. Why? Good question. Because there are so many different ways to look at the same pot. And insistence on self-protection related to the pot you carry with you 
is normal. Why do we not understand what's normal for us here at these levels? Good question. I don't have an answer. Not yet. But we have a love for ourselves that is not negative. We have a compassion and a hope for ourselves that we can continue past our relationship with what was before into that which is beginning to unfold ever so slowly. Even though we know it should be going faster, and even though if it did, we'd be a little scared, well, not a little scared, a lot scared, if it didn't follow the exact pathway as it did before. That's normal for us. So that's part of our our way of gauging things. I think I've pretty well covered this. And personally, I have a, a very wondrous hope for our Earth community in that there seems to be no judgment about how you use your relationship with that flow that enters into you. But I think we miss one tiny little ingredient. It enters into us and we use that flow for purposes that relate to actually helping us to see how we use it. It's like the soul is the teacher. But we only see that the way we use it, in the way we use it, is currently the only way to use it, or at least one of the most important ways to use it. It may be true, but not for long. Just a moment. How that moment, how long that moment lasts is based on how you can allow your sincerity to move you past where you are less nervous or into more nervous. It's a movement. It's a wondrous kindness. It's a love, actually, that we can engage with that that energetic flow for the purpose of doing almost anything just so we can see or attempt to see or be reminded to look at something that really may not be helpful to us. But we also know it's very difficult to clean our glasses off because they seem to be uh, forever spotted because we're self-protective. Don't give up. Continue for as long as you live for life is continuance and wondrous. Have a good evening. Good night.